Day coming to you live from Melbourne tonight. And joining me on the panel, our first international guest in real life in far too long, literary icon Roxanne Gay. Victorian Liberal Senator Sarah Henderson, who shares the inquiry into proposed anti-trolling laws. Author and Indigenous advocate Thomas Mayer, who's travelled here from Darwin. Former New South Wales Government Minister and commentator Prue Goward. And all the way from WA, remember that place? Member for Cowan and Arley. The borders really are open and it's wonderful to have everyone in the room tonight. Please make our panel welcome. Australia is in a cost of living crisis. The experience of many young people and students like myself is that for their entire adult life, they've faced unaffordable housing, expensive supermarket bills and insecure work. While yes, now petrol prices are exorbitant and it hurts, that's not the full story. My question is to Anna Lee and Sarah Henderson. Why have governments failed for so long to address the cost of living for young people? Mm. Sarah Henderson, let's start with you. You're sitting in the, in the seat of government and it's, it's to both sides of politics. Virginia, well, thank you for a great question. Uh, look, there are certainly some cost of living pressures at the moment, particularly with petrol. There's no doubt about that. But the fundamentals of our economy are very strong. So we've just today um, seen unemployment drop to 4.4%. Uh, unemployment for women is actually 3.8%. We've seen a very substantial jobs growth, another 375,000 jobs created uh, since before the pandemic. And of course, uh, we're seeing uh, wages increase as well. So the fundamentals are strong, but there are still pressures. There's no doubt about it. And we are very focused on those pressures. Uh, housing, I think, is uh, a particular issue. Uh, I know from where I come from in the Geelong region, even people seeking to rent are really actually starting to struggle. So. Uh, that's, I know, and I hope will be a particular focus in the budget, along with uh, cost of living pressures. And I, I hope that, I'm sure Josh Frydenberg is watching tonight. I, I don't have any particular insights, but I, I hope and I trust that uh, cost of living pressures will be addressed in the budget. But to, to go to the question, why have both sides of politics not made life in, in this very lucky country of ours more affordable for young people? Well, I don't really accept that because uh, if you look, for instance, at unemployment, um, we're almost at full employment. So uh, it's actually... The, I'm, the, I'm the, measure, the measure for full employment, now without getting lost in the weeds, the measure for full employment is pretty low these days. Sure, but uh, there are many, many uh, employers at the moment desperately looking for uh, young people to employ and we've actually seen... Um, really, really strong numbers for youth unemployment. That's dra dropped quite dramatically. So, uh, as I say, the fundamentals are very strong and our plan, Virginia, is all about continuing to grow a strong economy, driving those jobs, driving a stronger economy and make sure that through, for instance, our tax cuts, our tax cuts have delivered some $30 billion into the pockets of 11 million taxpayers. So we want to make sure that uh, more money stays in Australians' pockets. And I think that's part of the issue with Labor. Uh, Labor, as we know, we'll get, the we'll, last we'll, election... We'll get, we'll get well, to Labor. The question, Labor is, the, Labor... the question actually was to Anne well, Ali as well. Higher taxes is, a, is an issue and is, is a, a particular concern. Anne, Anne Ali, the question was to your side of mm. politics. And it skews both of you that you've, yeah. you've not done enough to actually make life more affordable in this country. I'm, I'm sorry, I forgot your name. Sorry. Sophie, thank you for the question, Sophie. And Sarah, I appreciate all the statistics and the numbers that you put out there, but none of those statistics and none of those numbers mean anything to Sophie or to anyone out there who's struggling at the moment to make ends meet. Um, and the fact is that prices are going up, whether it's a box of tissues, whether it's uh, food and, and whether it's indeed petrol. And of course, some of those pressures come from global events that, would, uh, uh, that are um, unforeseeable and that would present a challenge to any government. Uh, but let's not kid ourselves that everything is hunky-dory. Uh, it's not hunky-dory and it's certainly not hunky-dory for young people like Sophie. It's certainly not hunky-dory for many of the people in the, the community of Cowan when I go out and I knock on doors. If you want to know the story, if you want to know the impact, don't give me figures. Don't give me percentages and numbers. Look at the faces of the people who have to put half their shopping back at the counter 
because they can't afford to pay it. Well, let's get to the question. So, what has Labor done right. that's actually addressed that? So because there are a Sophie's saying that you haven't. Well, well, we're in opposition, Sophie. I think you know. But when that. you're in government, but, when you're in government, but and I'm getting to that now, Virginia. So, so there are a number of things. The first thing, there are a number of other ways to reduce the pressures. Of, on, on the household budget. One of the ways that Labor is proposing is, of course, childcare, making childcare more affordable. I know, as a young, single working mum, you know, rushing to pick up my children from childcare meant that I couldn't take on uh, any more hours and earning a minimum wage. And that meant the difference between being able to put food on the table one week and then not another week. So childcare is one. Good, secure jobs is another one. And the key to that is productivity. And we have a plan for productivity. And the third one is taking pressure off utilities and electricity prices by investing in renewables and making them more affordable. OK, let me get to the rest of the panel and I may come back to you if there's time. Prue Goward, what's been the policy failure here? Well, of course, uh, youth unemployment has always been very high for people who aren't students. Uh, I mean, I've, it's been as high as 33%. And in some regional communities, it's still very high. I actually think the failure is the lack of options for young people. If you don't go to university in Australia, your job options are uh, insecure, unskilled work. And we've had two years of a pandemic where you haven't had people coming in, but that is now going to change. And, Sophie, those pressures are going to be back on the young, unskilled job market. But what about the technical trade sector? I mean, we have done a disgraceful job as a series of state governments, I think, in technical education. We've been always slow off the mark, very difficult to get proper apprenticeships. That's where the opportunities are for kids who don't want to go to university for a whole lot of reasons. And I think we should have done a lot better uh, in uh, upskilling those, those, those kids, and we didn't do it. And... <laughs> Let me turn to Thomas. Thomas Mayer, what do you think? What do you think the policy failure has been here? Well, I think successive governments have failed because basically um, there's been this experiment of trickle-down economics that has obviously failed. I mean, um, you know, generation after generation, we've just seen richer get richer and the poorer get much poorer. Um, even through the pandemic, we saw billionaires make a whole heap more money while, while other people were desperate. And I think it also, I think um, the big thing that we need to consider here is that um, we have, um, you know, ever since the coalition government has, has gotten in, uh, there's been this attack on workers' rights. Um, we've seen wages stagnate for that reason. And, you know, to take away um, the ability for workers to, to, to collectivise, um, to build power, to be able to negotiate with big employers, um, that is so important to the whole economy. You know, this isn't just about workers versus um, business or anything. This is actually... It, it's all connected. When workers are paid well, when they're happy, when they've got secure jobs and aren't doing mm -hmm. casual work, doing three jobs and, and still struggling to make ends meet, um, then that's not good for anybody in this country. Um, to, to put in context, of course... <laughs> What you do, you're, you're an, you're an MUA, MUA um, union organiser and also a member of the Labor Party, so you come at it from that particular perspective, just so we understand that. But, Roxanne, are, are these similar discussions that are being had back in your home country, particularly Absolutely. for a younger generation? Absolutely. And there are a lot of young people educated and ready to join the workforce, but who are not willing to work for unreasonably low wages and very few benefits. And so, yes, unemployment may well be at 4% here, and I think the unemployment rate in the United States is quite similar, but when people are clamoring to find people to fill jobs, it's not because no one wants to work, it's because they're being offered really untenable working situations with not enough money, nothing to fall back on, and in, in the United States, we don't have universal health care. And so most Americans are one unfortunate illness away from bankruptcy, and that's no way to live. Mm. And so we have to start to tax the wealthy appropriately. And until yeah. you do that, there will never be enough money for anyone to thrive because billionaires are indeed getting <coughs> far wealthier. And capitalism is great. It serves me well. But I, I think that, I mean, it, it's like, let's just be honest. And the options aren't great. But yeah, there are very few things that people who don't luck into money um, can do. And so we have to do more than offer them policy ideas. We have to start to tax the rich. 
Like many others, I unsubscribed from my Spotify Premium account following the Joe Rogan controversy. Um, I made this decision as someone who understands the harm and consequences that come from the spread of myths and disinformation. Um, my question is, how can we as consumers trust media corporations to accurately uh, report information as it's happening in real time when it serves their interests financially to continue to support the harmful spread of this disinformation. Mm. Let's hear from everyone on the panel about this, but Roxanne Gay, you pulled your podcast also from Spotify for, for a similar reason. I did. I think that misinformation is one of the deadliest issues that we're facing presently because in the United States, a great many people, millions upon millions of people decided to politicize masks and vaccines and choose to prolong the pandemic in ways that have been really consequential. And so to see someone like Joe Rogan get paid $200 million on Spotify to support quacks and idiots and racists, well, that's fine, free speech. But I choose who I do business with and I'm certainly not gonna do business with a company that thinks that's okay. And right now, the onus is upon us to educate ourselves and to make sure that we are seeking out accuracy. But what's really happening right now that's pernicious is that this, this, all of this misinformation and this disinformation is making people trust actually trustable news sources. Mm. And people are saying, oh, the war in the Ukraine is, or the war in Ukraine is fake news. when <laughs> It's really not. And so if we don't take these stands now, we have no hope, and it's incredibly important that we hold uh, companies accountable, and as consumers, the best way we can do that is by walking away with our money. Do you agree, Prue? Well, I think there's always been a tension between news gathering and entertainment. Um, you know, Charles Dickens, go right back through newspapers, let alone television and Channel 9 and, and, and commercial television particularly, the need to make a buck, make it entertaining, as well as newsworthy. But I agree, it's about the reputation of the news gatherer um, and this is now just a much more crowded market and the consumers have to be much better informed about who they trust. I personally, I would stay in with Spotify, otherwise that awful guy has lost, has won and we've all lost. I, I mean, I absolutely, people are entitled to do what they want to do, but uh, I would have stayed on that battlefield. I'd have kept, um, um, telling the story with the facts and, and the truth that I thought people deserve to hear. Or he's won. Isabella, is, is it possible that, that over time you might actually regret losing your Spotify account and might want to, um, to, to go back? I don't think so. I think that there is a moral and ethical responsibility on these mm. corporations to make sure that the information they're feeding yeah. consumers who may not be as well informed as people who can look to alternate sources um, this may be the only information they get, and I, I think that something really needs to happen there. I, I agree with free speech. I think it's incredibly important. I think it's essential. But I do think that there's a responsibility on those organisations to make sure the information is accurate. But it's Virginia. complicated. It's complicated. Yeah, I'll, I'll come to you in a second, um, Thomas. But it's complicated, isn't it, Roxanne? Because I know you wrote in the editorial piece that I think published in the New York Times talking about you leaving Spotify, that um, you also disagree with you know, much of what the uh, Rupert Murdoch's newspapers mm -hmm. publish around the world. That causes you grief. You disagree with it. You see it as a form of disinformation in some respects. And yet you're staying publishing with a publisher that is owned by the Rupert Murdoch Corporation, so yes. it, it ain't straightforward. No, it absolutely isn't, and honestly, there's no such thing as ethical production or consumption in a capitalist economy, and so you this have... This compromises to, the whole way. It is, it really is, and you know, the thing is, I am still on the battlefield, uh, even though my podcast isn't on Spotify, because it's available everywhere else that podcasts are available, right. <laughs> and... We're all doing advertising You know, <laughs> <laughs> I just there think there, there are stances that are worth taking, and mm. in terms of, you know, Rupert Murdoch, it definitely, my, I'm published through HarperCollins in terms of my nonfiction, and it has served me very well. And I have a wonderful editor and a wonderful team behind me. And so I look at that and know with Spotify, I didn't have any sort of personal connection. Yeah. My podcast mm. is simply available there. And unfortunately, a significant number of my listeners did come from Spotify, but many of them have followed me. And I trust myself and what I have to offer to trust that people will understand my moral compass and go where it leads. 
Thomas? Yeah, I think that, um, you know, harmful misinformation should be removed from those platforms. And Isabella, you know, as a First Nations person, I'm just... This is something that we live with all the time. I mean, the Murdoch media... I'll never forget the Australian, 2015, I think it was, the Bill Leak cartoon that showed an Aboriginal man facing a, a policeman that was holding a small Aboriginal boy by the, by the scruff of the neck. The Aboriginal man's holding a beer and he's saying... Talking about responsibility... Uh, to the Aboriginal man and, and the Aboriginal man saying, yeah, all right, so what's his name? It was just disgusting. You know, this sort of harmful misinformation is all through the media about First Nations people and who we are and how we live and how we love our children. And it's, it's just absolutely this sort of misinformation shouldn't be acceptable to any of us mm. and how we spend our money. You, um, you put together a collection of, of, of essays of letters of fathers, um, Indigenous fathers, to, to their sons called Dear Son. Was that cartoon the, the catalyst for it? It was just one catalyst of so many. I mean, even, like, the 2007 intervention was an absolute farce. You know, it was millions and millions of dollars went into disempowering the most vulnerable Aboriginal people in communities. The army was turned against its own citizens in those communities and went in there. And a Prime Minister basically announced to the rest of the country that, that the issues, those social issues in those communities... Um, was an Aboriginal problem in complete ignorance of the harms that colonisation, of genocide or failed policies have done. There were women in those communities, of course, who wanted to see some action taken to protect them and, and their children too. It was, it, was, it was very, very complicated at the time to, to acknowledge their voices, but to do it in a way that didn't disempower everyone. But if they had have listened to those women, they would not have had the intervention. I mean, the government suspended the Racial Discrimination Act to be able to do what they did. I don't think there's any Aboriginal woman that wanted that sort of measure that was just... And we know today that it was, it was built on a fabrication and that it has not helped our people at all. It's taken us backwards. Let me return to the question, and, and Ali, mm. uh, it, it takes us to not only disinformation, mm. of course, but to life on the net and what can be said and what's done. I know that you've been pretty viciously trolled over the years, personally, haven't you? Oh, yeah, I think I'm probably one of the most trolled people in Parliament. <laughs> um, look, I think, in a, in, to an extent, misinformation and disinformation have always existed in some form or other, mm. whether you called it propaganda or... or um, and I don't think it's going to get any better. I think, uh, mm. given the, uh, the, the, the media environment that we have today, the fact is that people can choose what they want. There's a lot more choice. I think the key piece here is educating our young people to be have a critical mind when they approach a text um, to really look at the, the, the origins of that text and to be able to pick apart and analyse where there might be misinformation and disinformation, mistruths, where there are grey areas, where so there is propaganda. So teaching critical thinking is the thing? Absolutely, we have to teach critical thinking and I'm, I'm gunning here for the humanities and, and you know, really lifting the humanities the way that we teach the humanities at universities as well. I know that um, the Morrison government has really cut the humanities and undermined the humanities, but this is how you grow a generation of young people who are going to be able to deal with the challenges of a media environment where you can do, what it, you can do so much, but misinformation, disinformation, mm. propaganda, it is the way of the world now. Yeah. This week, the Prime Minister issued branding for a women's forum that managed to unflatteringly depict women's bodies and include a phallus. He then reverse fat shamed the leader of the opposition, somehow implying that Mr Albanese, by losing weight, was now inauthentic. I'm wondering, does the Liberal Party still have a women problem? And is this the kind of leadership that Australians can expect? Sarah Henderson. <laughs> Well, firstly, on that logo, I agree. Um, the Department of um, Prime Minister and Cabinet, not the, not the Prime Minister, not the Prime Minister's office, they had nothing to do with mm. that logo. Although they say... I'll just jump in there. They say well, um, the statement from the Prime Minister's office, I have to put this on the record, said um, that there was wide consultation about that logo and yet neither the Prime Minister nor his office were consulted. So, you know... Well, I'm just... Wide consultation. Well, the PMC. Department, yeah, the Prime Minister Department of Prime yeah. Minister and Cabinet is a very large yes. department and it does consult very widely. But just putting that on the record... Let's have a look at the logo uh, if you're missing it. We'll just show that for a second in case but, you, uh, you missed this wonderful bit of design. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, it looks like a gun. What do you see, Roxanne? I, when you look I, at that, what, I what do, do you agree see? That, that, <laughs> I mean, who's drawing the dirty pictures? I don't see I do I agree know. that uh, that was very misplaced and I'm very pleased that the department is going back to the drawing board. 
Let's get to the serious point, though. Can I just say, though, as is, a yeah, minister, as a former minister, yeah. you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. You hire some wretched consultant who goes away and does all the consultations and comes <laughs> up with all... The, and you, they put them in front of you and you say, oh, I don't like that, it looks like... Fun. No, minister, you wouldn't know. We've consulted widely. <laughs> and if you... So if you reject it, you're then... Uh, why are you challenging public service advice? And if you accept it, then it's your fault because so you should have... Are these designers men who are putting it in front of you? <laughs> That's the question. No, no, I'm just giving okay. you an example that, uh, I mean, when you're taking advice from so-called experts, okay. it's very difficult um, to be able to distinguish between what you think. I mean, you look at it and you think That's rubbish. And you say it's rubbish, and the consultant and the public service department on the other side of the table says, oh, Minister, I, th I don't think you understand how widely we consult. Thomas, is, is that something you scrawled on a wall once when you were a naughty kid? <laughs> I suppose I did, yeah. <laughs> 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 but I just think it's, it's laughable, you know, like, that this has even passed through. Mm. I mean, jeez. It's just... Am I missing something? It took me a while yeah. to figure out that it was a... a tiny little purple willy. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, I mean, there are so many things wrong with it. Like, yeah, there it's are. literally... I thought at first it was the W, and I'm like... It, okay, it, is, the w. it is, but it's just okay. bad. And also, yeah, anyone bad. under the age of, say, 40 knows that purple, uh, something of length, ah. is the eggplant emoji. Yes. And <laughs> is that right? I mean, it's just tragic, <laughs> and this is why diversity and inclusion matter, mm -hmm. because clearly... There were no black women in that room. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, maybe no women. Yeah. <laughs> well, that, that's very true. I mean, a woman in the room would have gone if she didn't see, you know, dick and balls. Sorry, we have to. Are we have to. <laughs> are we have to <laughs> nine o'clock yet? Uh, would have seen Frank boobs. and beans. Frank and beans. Yeah, would have seen boobs and gone. That's equally yeah. as bad. Anyway, look, it was an, it was an absolute snafu, and so clearly they've gone back to the drawing board. But mm. um, but Libby's question also goes to this repeated issue of whether. Mm. Uh, the government and the Prime Minister has a women's problem. Can I just read this to you, Sarah Henderson? So this is... Um, well, if, let's play this. Let's have a listen to what the Prime Minister had to say at a town hall on Monday. This is one of the points that, um, that Libby's going to. Have a look. I'm not pretending to be anyone else. We're still wearing the same glasses. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> sadly, the same suits. Um, and I... <laughs> And I weigh about the same, <laughs> and I don't mind a bit of Italian cake either. <laughs> um, so I'm happy in my own skin. I'm not pretending to be anyone else. Um, and when you're, when you're Prime Minister, you can't pretend to be anyone else. You've got to know who you are. So they're the comments that Libby Black's calling out, uh, and, of course, that was his attempt to call out uh, Mr Albanese's inauthentic. Um, just reading here, this is from your government's own national men's health strategy, Sarah Henderson. The high levels of chronic conditions among men in Australia reinforces the need for an increasing focus on promoting healthy lifestyle choices and decreasing health risk factors, including smoking, overweight and obesity, physical inactivity and poor dietary choices, all of which are more prevalent in men than women. So is Anthony Albanese following the national guidelines better than the Prime Minister is? <laughs> Virginia, I would have no idea. I think... To well, he be, just said to that be, he wasn't. To be very fair, I think the Prime Minister was making the point that in Anthony Albanese we don't see someone that we can trust as an authentic politician. Well, he, well, he, was, trying to make, he was trying to make that point via clothes and weight and glasses. So well, let's uh, return to the question. Is that the kind of leadership we can expect to see from your oh, government? Look, I think that's a bit of an unfair question, Virginia. Uh, I, don't I think, think the Black's Prime question Minister was, was really trying to say that a leopard doesn't change his or her spots. And we do know that Anthony Albanese has a track record of supporting high taxes on housing, on retirees... Oh, no, we're, we're, seeing, we're still going into... And a, no, we're no, 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 we're still going into a political rant that doesn't and relate to the question. No, I'm not ranting, but let me just no, make this point. Is that's that, not what the question is was, that Sarah The Prime Minister was talking about authenticity and that he's not going to change who And that is. being overweight is and authentic, and was what he was saying. Well, it is for him. he was talking about his own <laughs> yeah. weight. I'm not going to talk about his weight or anyone's weight, frankly. Even though he was speaking um, with Anthony but, but I think that was the point he was making. Let's go to Anne Ali. I just... I just found it really distasteful. And, you know, at the benefit of the doubt, it was an error of judgement. Um, but I actually think that's more the Prime Minister's character, unfortunately. Um, and I don't like it. And I don't think a lot of Australians like it that when they see our leaders talking like that. 
Do you think that sort of attempt at calling out what, what he clearly wants to be seen as inauthenticity, do you think that lands? Does that work, Thomas? Not when you're being a hypocrite. I think that Scott Morrison is pretending to be a good Prime Minister. What's, what's the hypocrisy? Well, the hypocrisy is that his, his government has failed in all sorts of things for so long. I mean, the hypocrisy is that he's, he's a pretender, you know? I mean, he's, he's pretending to care about Australians. He, he actually needs an empathy coach to be able to pretend well, and he's not doing it well. I think that's really deeply offensive, Thomas. I mean, I, all, all of it's us... It's not, not offensive. It's Thomas's view, and he's allowed... No. I want to go to Roxanne. No, but Roxanne I think Gay? it is offensive. Because <laughs> let, all let, of us... Just, no, let me hear from Roxanne. Just, just, just to say, all of us who go into politics and public life do it for the right reasons, and myself, everyone. OK. And I just think that that was probably not... Well, he shouldn't attack really, Al really Albanese's really weight and what do you mean? I, I think Thomas is allowed to criticise the Prime Minister. It's kind of why we're here. But well, I'm allowed to say that it's offensive too. Well... I don't know about offensive, yeah. but yeah. Well, that's you may my disagree. View. You know, I think any time you bring someone's body and their lives into public discourse for nefarious reasons, it just is a really sad reflection on your character or the mm. lack thereof. Mm. And when politicians do it, it's really incredibly hypocritical because, yeah. I mean, many of them live wildly, supposedly unhealthy lifestyles yeah. and then want to then, when it's convenient, start to point at one another and say, oh, no, look, I'm still healthy. I like my Italian cake. <laughs> and, you know, why? Is that really going to help the people of Australia yeah. right now after two years of lockdown and a reeling economy yeah. and so many other issues. And of course, many countries around the world are dealing with this. But I think it's really challenging for everyday people to see their leader speak like this and insult another candidate and then think, this person has my best interests at heart. I'd like to acknowledge and pay my respects to the rightful owners of the land upon which we gather, the First Nations people of the Eastern Kulin Nation. My question is for Thomas. It, is our society normalised and numb to seeing injustice inflicted upon people of colour? Would the recent acquittal of Northern Territory Police Officer Zachary Rolfe over the death of Kamon Jai Walker, what do you think would have happened if the accused was a man of colour and the victim white? Yes, thank you for the question. I think um, this, this whole country has been, it's not about normalising, this whole country has been built on, on the injustices to First Nations people and has and just been, that's what Australia is right now, um, a, a complete injustice to First Nations people that have had their land stolen, that have suffered from genocide, forced assimilation, uh, all of these things and I, I got a call from a, a sister in uh, a community near Yundamu, a Gurindji woman just the other night. Um, after the, uh, the acquittal of Rolf, and there's genuine fear in our communities, in, in our families, that the same will happen to our young, our young people, you know, to, to our children. Um, he should not have... Um, I, think, I think the main thing here is that in, this, in the same week um, that Rolf was, was acquitted, uh, another First Nations man, another 19-year-old, was shot six times in Palmerston, and tasered as well, and the police jumped all over him. And this is the sort of thing that is that we're seeing far too often. We've had we've had over 500 deaths in custody now, over 500 deaths in custody, and not one of the families that have called for justice have received it. And I think it goes to the way that laws are made in this country, that the laws don't take into account the prejudice and the racism that we experience every day. The laws are made by mostly non-Indigenous men mostly white men, that have never experienced the racism that we experience. And it's one of the reasons why I think the Uluru Statement is so important. It calls for a First Nations voice enshrined in the Constitution. And until we start to say what happens in our communities, until we start to have uh, uh, the influence on the laws to make sure that this is taken into account, then we're not going to see justice. Just one more thing is that if they just listen to the Walpuri people, the Walpuri elders in their community that have said, we want a ceasefire, we don't want guns in our communities, and, and I don't do, think there do would be a need be, for guns in our community. Do you think this if, incident will actually uh, lead to a, um, a real meaningful discussion about that, about how guns are used or, or not used and deployed by NT police? Yeah, absolutely. It should, it should be... Um, the Walpuri should be listened to, that the guns should be laid down 
and they should listen to those communities about how justice can happen in our communities, how we can be cared for, you know, how we can heal, because there would be no need for guns if we were treated with respect and if our lives really mattered. Roxane Gay, are there lessons, anything we can pick up here from the US experience from the Black Lives Matter movement as well? Well, I think that in the United States we're in the exact same situation where black lives absolutely do not matter and police brutality continues unchecked. Uh, I live in Los Angeles part-time and the police there have a lot of impunity when it comes to shooting unarmed people and armed people. They just ignore due process and they don't value black life and there are, there are no consequences. And so, you know, there is very little light at the end of that particular tunnel until we see a shift in power and an acknowledgement mm -hmm. that the current system where the police are really given military-like powers, you know, and are allowed to shoot people in the back, which means someone is running away, uh, you know, until we address that and address the racism underlying all of it, we're not really going to solve the issue in any way. That's all we have time for. Please thank our panel. Roxanne Gay, Sarah Henderson, Thomas Mayer, Prue Goward and Anne Ali.